Hi boys and girls! I know the last few chapters of The Park of Inheritance haven't been the easiest to read or listen to, but I would like to tell you that the next chapter that we're going to read today is going to have some pretty exciting news in it. Um, before we do that, we need to finish chapter 33, and yesterday we were reading about um, Adam Douglas and Chip Douglas arriving at the Washington's house after Coach Dub had been attacked by the Allens. And Siobhan was trying to figure out how they were going to make sure that Reggie Bradley was okay. So that's where I'm going to start up again. We ain't doing nothing but getting you all packed up, Smitty said. Your daddy didn't get the life beat out of him so you could go waltzing around the city, inviting them to do the same to you. But what about Reggie? I'll find him, Adam Douglas said. He stepped forward and took Siobhan's hand in his. Trust me, I'll find him. Siobhan stood there for a long time as water pooled in her eyes. She released Adam Douglas's hands, then slipped a small bracelet off her arm. She held it up, and for a moment, Chip thought she was going to hand it to his father. But she eventually placed it back on her wrist. Please find Reggie, she said. As the tears broke free, keep him safe. He's got such a temper. I'm, wor I'm worried he'll do something stupid. I will, Adam Douglas said. Now you go on and finish helping your mom get packed up. He glanced at Dub. And you should lay down. You've got a long trip ahead of you. Dub nodded, then tried to right himself in the chair. Eventually, Smitty grabbed him underneath his arms and hoisted him from the seat. Siobhan rushed over and let her father lean onto her. I've got you, Daddy, she said. Chip didn't know how she could support so much weight. Adam waited for her and Dub to leave the room before speaking again. Smitty, I need you to go find the other boys. We've got to get them out of town, too. At least for a little while. Maybe just until school starts. But what about Dub and his family? Smitty asked. There's no way he can drive his car up to his sister-in-law's place by himself. Chip will take him, he said, turning to his son. Now listen up, Chip. I want you to drive straight there. Don't speed. Have Dub and the others stay down in the back seat until you get to Virginia. They'll be uncomfortable, but it'll be safer for everybody that way. He patted his son's cheek. Can you handle that? Chip nodded. Yes, sir. I'll take care of them. As soon as you get them settled, you take the bus home, his father said. I'll be back as soon as I can, once I get Reggie out of here. Adam Douglas took a deep breath, then looked up at the ceiling. Smitty, I need to borrow the keys to your place, and I'm also going to need to borrow your gun. Chapter 34 Candace couldn't sleep. The bed was too hot. The pillow was too flat. She kept thinking about the way Brandon disappeared into his house the previous afternoon. Tori had come back out a few minutes later, saying that Brandon wasn't feeling well and was going to skip the Juneteenth festival. Candace hadn't seen him since. The festival was great, though. She climbed the rock wall three times and tried a bunch of different foods, including PJ's world-famous hush puppies, which were so good that she came back for seconds and thirds, and pulled pork from a local barbecue restaurant. Candace hung out with Tori and her friends, they were all so cool and so fun, but she missed Brandon. Tori kept checking her phone, hoping that Brandon would call and ask to be picked up, but he never did. He didn't come out of the house for church that morning either. He didn't drop by that afternoon. She emailed him a few times from her mom's phone, but he never replied. Finally, after a few more minutes of tossing and turning, Candace got out of bed her iPod was almost dead, but she figured it had enough battery to last through a few songs. She pressed the buds into her ears and scrolled through until she found one of her dad's old playlists. Happy Music, Volume 1. It was filled with late 70s and early 80s music that he loved. Earth, Wind & Fire, Michael Jackson, and Tina Marie. The music didn't help Candace fall asleep, but she did feel better. She picked up her notes on Parker's letter. She still believed the third clue was telling them to add something up, that the sum would lead to Parker's inheritance. But the idea was beginning to seem more and more unrealistic. Then again, all of this seemed unrealistic. And if she was really leaving soon, maybe none of it mattered anyway. Maybe it was already too late. She decided to page through the yearbooks again. That was her default when she was stuck, to look at the photos. James Parker had to be there and she was just overlooking him. She reached down by her bed, then realized all of the Wallace yearbooks were on the kitchen table by her laptop. Instead, she grabbed the 1956 Perkins yearbook, 
She had already checked all the teachers, but she figured she'd look one more time. She flipped through, and just like before, there were no teachers who even remotely resembled James Parker. She turned to the photo of the tennis team. Candace sat up. She rubbed her eyes. Then she looked again. Candace had studied the tennis team photo from the 1957 yearbook so many times, but she hadn't looked at the photo in this yearbook. She hadn't seen any need to. It was 1956, and 1957 was the important year. There was a boy in the black and white photo, tall, lanky, light-skinned. Candace would have almost said he was white, but that was impossible. White kids weren't allowed to attend Perkins back then. The boy had curly hair. No, maybe not curly, but frizzy. Kind of like her classmate Heather's hair when it rained. She found his name in the caption. Reginald Bradley. She flipped through the book until she found his photo. There he was, with the same fair skin and frizzy hair. He was a junior in 1956. Had he been a senior in 1957? And if so, why had he stopped playing tennis? Candace sprinted to the kitchen table. She flipped through the 1957 yearbook to the senior photos. There he was again. It took an eternity for her laptop to boot up. She opened the photo when she had downloaded from the internet at school. The man was older, with more wrinkles and less hair. His nose and cheeks looked a little bit different, thinner and sharper, but his eyes were the same, big, gray, round, and angry. She had finally found James Parker. Chapter 35, Reginald Bradley, 1957. When Reginald Lawrence Bradley was a child, his grandmother would threaten to pop him with one of her wooden baking spoons any time he complained about being poor or not having a father or wearing the same pair of jeans day after day. Boy, you're better off than most people, she would say. Later that night, she would slice him an extra thick piece of cornbread with his dinner. His grandmother didn't want to acknowledge it, but Reggie did really have it worse than a lot of his classmates. His mother had run away from home as a teenager, only to return three years later with a half-white baby in her arms. She never told anyone who the father was. All Reggie knew was that he lived in New York. His mother promised to take him to Brooklyn to meet his daddy one day. But when she left home again five years later, Reggie remained in Lambert. It took five more years for Reggie to accept that she was never returning for him. Kids liked to tease Reggie about his mother, about his father, about his tattered clothes and his golden skin and his funny gray eyes. Reggie responded with his fists. He didn't care if his opponent was bigger or smaller. If it was one boy or a group, he wasn't taking lip from anyone. Coach Dub was the first person to take Reggie's anger and channel it into something positive. He first put Reggie on the football team and the basketball teams, but the boy got in too many scuffles with his teammates. Reggie tried track next, and he liked it. He didn't have to work with anyone. He only had to compete against himself and the clock. From there, Coach Dub had him try out for tennis. With a racket in his hand, and when he could remember to keep his temper and serve under control, Reggie really thrived. Coach Dub was the best thing that had ever happened to Reggie. He gave Reggie structure and purpose, and a means to find personal success. Thanks to Coach Dub, Reggie believed he could be more than just a poor boy from the South. And then he messed everything up by falling in love. To be fair, most of the boys at school were at least a little bit in love with Siobhan. She was so smart and so kind, and extremely easy on the eyes. She never said or did, an said or did anything that made Reggie feel bad about himself. Even when he was sitting at her dining room table, stuffing his face because he didn't know where his next meal would come from, she never laughed at him for wearing the same threadbare clothes. They had only been seeing each other for a year, but it felt like so much longer. Coach Douglas's son had strode into the library like he owned the entire school. Siobhan had given him a word puzzle. Chip didn't know the answer, but Reggie did. His mother used to play word games like that with him before she left. Feeling bold, Reggie left a note at her locker, asking her to meet him in the park, not really expecting her to show up. But she had come, and she kept coming back, and a year later, they were in love. But since her father wouldn't allow her to date, they had to keep their relationship a secret. Outside of group functions, they rarely talked to each other at school. 
They didn't send each other any notes. Whenever Reggie ate a meal at Coach Dub's house, he was sure to sit as far away from her as he could. He didn't tell any of his friends, and neither did she. But eventually, Coach Dub discovered their courtship. He responded by kicking Reggie off the tennis team in the middle of the season and threatened to send Siobhan away for the last year of her high school. Reggie wanted to run off with her, but Siobhan had always been the smarter of the two. She wisely turned him down. Reggie didn't believe he had anything to offer her. He was intelligent, but that wouldn't put food on the table. He was kind, especially towards children, but that wouldn't cover the rent. Reggie had no real way to support her, provide for her, protect her. He knew she deserved better than him. Still, he hoped Coach Dub would come to come around to give Reggie a real opportunity with his daughter. When Coach Douglas approached him about playing in the exhibition game, he thought he'd finally had his chance, but he didn't. On the night of the game, after they'd won, Coach Dub shook Reggie's hand, then leaned, him, leaned in and told him to leave his daughter alone. A poor country dumb boy like you will never be good enough for Lil Dub, he said. And that's where I'm going to stop for today. Um, how surprised are you that Reggie Bradley, which if you don't remember, was Siobhan's boyfriend, is really James Parker. I want to know if any of you predicted that right. And I also want to know what you think about why he's going by a different name. 